So welcome to Math 331, Lecture 19. And what we're going to do is talk about some questions inspired by various places I have been visiting recently, uh, University of North Dakota, looking at the school for my son and one of his friends, as well as a math conference on recreational math at the University of Albany. And so I have unfortunately some ideas of how to solve these problems. I've been deliberately trying not to think fully so that we can do it together. Um, okay. So the first, and there is cultural extra credit, but you have to get at least four of the schools. You can talk to each other. You can talk to friends. You cannot use any electronic resources. Where are these schools from? Farber College, Grand Lakes University, Monsters University, Springfield University, Starfleet Academy, and what's the matter you? So I'm listing the retention rate for first years. What percent of incoming students graduate after four years, six years, and eventually? Do these numbers look reasonable or does anything look suspicious to you? What kind of checks do you do whenever you see numbers? What should be true? Give me some statements. Yes. Uh, six years should be above four years. And Almost. Should, Try again. The six years should, should be, be at, least at least the same as. Years. So do we have that at least? Uh, yeah. Good. So none of the six years is worse than four years. What else should we have? The eventually it should be at least as great as six years. The eventually should be at least as great as six years. We have that. What else should we have? Yes. No, no, it's not graduate, it's retained. Make it to their second year. Oh, sorry. Right, so it's the retention rate. How many people leave after one year? And then after four years, what percent of the incoming people who arrived graduate? Yes. Uh, it's strange that graduating eventually can be higher than the retention rate. Yeah, is, are we a little surprised about that? What is the definition of retention? Like, could they have left and then come back? So that's an interesting question is what if somebody left and came back? What if you have transfer students and we're gonna have you know, potentially transfer students uh, visiting class at some point? How do you view something like that? So every now and then, whenever you look at data, this is something I want you to be thinking about. Does the data make sense? Are there any simple tests I can do? Uh, sometimes when you look at baseball data, you have a double header. And sometimes the computer processing doesn't deal with it appropriately because it's two different games on the same day. If a game is suspended, when the game is resumed, all the stats count from the original day. You actually have people who got their first major league home run before they entered the major leagues. Because they might've entered on, you say, yeah. July 5th, and then on July 10th, they're finishing a game that was suspended on May 8th, and it counts as a May 8th. So you could have strange, strange situations. So. These are some datas. And so here's a very natural question. Assume P percent of students graduate after four years and every subsequent year after that, P percent of the remaining students graduate. Does everyone eventually graduate? So I'll let you think for a moment. So after four years, P percent of all the students who arrived graduate. Nobody fails, nobody flunks out. So we'll assume no one leaves before four years. So do you think everybody graduates? Is P greater than zero? Excellent. So if P equals zero, no. What if P is greater than zero? Instead of remaining, uh... Every subsequent year, does it mean P percent of the previous year? P percent of the people who are left. Oh, who are left. Graduate. After four years. Right. So after four years, P percent of the people who arrived graduate. Then I look at the people who have not graduated, and P percent of them graduate. And then I look at the people after five years who haven't graduated, and P percent of those graduate. What do you think? Okay, why? And so what's the sum? So what sum do you want to calculate? Yes. 
Okay, so we could do number students graduate. So that would be P after four years. How many would it be after five years? Well, we could, we could, we could look at instead of number, let's do percent, right? Because that, that's much easier because we can always then just multiply by the number of students. So the percent of students who graduate, P percent graduate after four years. How many graduate after exactly five? Right, I don't want to write it as P minus P squared though. P times one minus P. And I'm actually going to write it as one minus P times P. And how many graduate after six years? And only six years. We have to look at how many people are left, right? Okay, right? So how many people are left after five years? So it's the number left times P, right? One minus. So the number left is one minus what? Nope, not just the second term. The first term. The first term and minus the second term, right? Does this simplify nicely? So you get one minus P quantity squared. If you look at it, what percent of people don't graduate after one year? It's one minus P. What percent don't graduate after two years? One minus P times one minus P. You're gonna just get a geometric series. So it's just going to be the sum, K goes from zero to N of one minus P to the N times P. What does that sum equal? I'm sorry? Why P to the power N plus? Oh, sorry, this should be to infinity, sorry. Okay. So to infinity. Yeah, so what, what should this be? Nope, we're doing the sum. So right, why is it one? What's the formula for geometric series? It's one over one minus R. And then we have to multiply by P. So it's just P times one over one minus R here is one minus P. And that's just P over P, which equals one. So everybody graduates. Another way to look at it is after N years, percent left is one minus P to the N, which goes to zero. So there's two ways we could do this. One way we could do this as an infinite sum and look at how many graduate after four years, after five years, after six years, and so on. And here, N is just going to be the number of years beyond four. And if we do that, we get eventually everybody graduates. And this kind of makes sense. As long as the graduation rate is positive, then that means a smaller and smaller percent of people don't make it. If you look, there is your know, huge differences in the graduation rate. This reflects your know, national trends. There are some schools, especially state schools, where it's very easy to get in, but it's not very easy to stay, where they were very willing to give you a chance. There are other schools where once you're in, you're basically in. And you know, I will not use any real schools. I won't mention schools like Harvard by name. Uh, we're not only, we, I, I won't talk about how you would even I'm smart enough not to say that. All right. So you could also look at it as what percent of students are left after n years. And that's a much easier calculation. And then I can just see that the percent that's left is just one minus p to the n. Do we agree that this problem is not easy? Really? You think this is not easy? Well, I'd say this problem is easy. Right? 
This is easy. Let's make it interesting. So here's one way to begin. Assume P percent of students graduate and Q percent leave after four years. And once you leave, you never come back. And every subsequent year, P percent of the remaining graduate and Q percent leave. So every year, P percent of all the students left graduate, Q percent of all the students who are left leave and never return. And then everybody else, status indeterminate, and you go forward another year. And then you go forward another year, and then you look at everybody who's left, P percent of those graduate, Q percent of those leave and never return. Do you think everybody graduates now? Does everybody graduate? No. Well, it must be true for everybody not to graduate. Q is zero. Right, as long as Q is not zero, then it's not going to be the case that everybody graduates. You're going to lose some people immediately. Does everybody believe everybody will leave without a diploma? No, as long as P is positive, some people will get a diploma. What can you tell me about the percent who get a diploma eventually? So let XPQ equal percent eventually get a diploma. Do you want me to use the letter X or do you want me to use the letter D for diploma? D might be better so that when we look at it, we can think, do you want D or graduate? D or G? D. And then what should we do for the people who leave? Do you want to use L? Do you want to use... W for withdraw. I don't like L because L is often too close to a one. I mean, I, I could try to do like a script L, but I like W for withdraw. And again, you want notation so you can quickly look down and see what's going on. So W is going to be the percent who eventually withdraw. And like Charlie on the MTA, never return. Okay. They couldn't affair the fear increase of the university. Okay, what can you tell me about DPQ? What do you know about it? Probably is positive. It's well, greater than equal to zero, and it's some positive function with respect to uh, P, and it's a negative function. Okay, so DPQ as P goes up should go up or stay the same. As Q goes down, should go down or stay the same. You said it was greater than or equal to zero. Go up. As Q goes up. Oh, sorry, um, as Q goes up, sorry. Let's make Q go up, I'm sorry, thank you. You said it's greater than or equal to zero. I think you can give me a better lower bound. Uh, greater than yeah. And can anybody give me an upper bound? Uh, almost. One minus Q. Yeah. You could have been a smart ass and given me, you know, two as an upper bound. Um, you could have given me one as the trivial upper bound, but we can actually do a little bit better. We know it's going to be somewhere between P and one minus Q. So the question is, how can we solve this? So one way is we could try to do an infinite sum. So how many people graduate after four years? So that's just going to be our P. Now, how many people are left after four years? Well, what percent of people are left after four years? One minus, Q, yeah. One minus P minus Q. And how many of those graduate after another year? P. So this is um, after four years. This is after five years. How many people have not graduated or withdrawn after two years? After years four and five, how many people are left? So 
So we started with one. And then after one year, the percent that was left was one minus P minus Q. Because P graduated, Q withdrew. How many people are left after two years? One minus P minus, well, you, you could do one minus that quantity, but there's a nice way to, well, you also have to remember there's the people who withdrew. It's not just this quantity. And then you have to do all that, but there's an easier way than doing all that subtraction. How many people are left? One minus P minus Q squared. One minus P minus Q squared. The fraction of people who stay after a year is one minus P minus Q. And now how many of these people will graduate? P. And this is now six years. And then how many people will be there after seven years? One minus P minus Q to what power? Cubed. And so this is a geometric series. So it's going to be P times one over one minus one minus P minus Q. And you know, doing this algebra in my head, I get P over P plus Q. Can you tell me what WPQ will be? Do we have to do the whole calculation again, or can you just tell me what WPQ is going to be? So it will be one minus this quantity if eventually everybody either graduates or withdraws. If you accept that eventually everybody either graduates or withdraws, you're absolutely correct, it's one minus this. What's the third state? Well, that's the question is, could you have a third state of people who just never graduate or never withdraw? You know, this is the Charlie on the MTA. He's constantly riding through the streets of Boston, if anybody knows the song. They're perpetually in school. They're perpetually in school. Like we call them humanity students. It's like when you watch college football and they're like a math Right, right. Withstanding. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you look at this, we actually know that eventually everybody graduates or withdraws. You know, if P and Q are both positive, or if at least one of them is positive then one minus P minus Q is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So you could say W um, PQ is just gonna be one minus DPQ, or it equals Q over Q plus P by one of my favorite words, symmetry. If you look at the calculation we just did, just flip the roles of P and Q. The calculation we just did for calculating the percent who graduate is the same as calculating the percent who withdraw. We're just changing the words from graduate to withdraw. How many people either read or had Dr. Seuss read to them? Do you know the sneeches? There are two types of sneeches. Who are the best sneeches? It's a trick question. They're all equally good, but it takes us several pages to learn that. You know, initially, there are sneeches with stars on their bellies, and there are sneeches that don't have stars on their bellies. And you can just do this one-to-one -one correspondence. You know, I can just flip everybody with a star to without a star, and everybody without a star to one with a star. And so if I just switch the role of graduating and withdrawing, the same argument will give me the same answer with the roles of P and Q change. And what does graduate plus withdraw add up to? Over P plus Q. So it adds up to one, it adds up to 100%. So everybody is captured, there's no perpetual students. Everybody either gets a degree or leaves. Okay. Yes. I think that uh huh. Right. So, so this is an interesting question. Is um, can you come up with a process where you can stay in that middle state and never hit the top or the bottom? 
With this model, the answer is no. In this model, you will eventually hit one or the other. You will not have a perpetual student. So this may not be a rich enough model to describe graduate school for some people. Um, I will not talk about my actual experiences, but I will say I may know of a graduate school that claimed certain programs were four-year programs. In a decade, how many students should you graduate in a graduate program if you claim to be a four-year program in four years? 100%. So you've so that means not one person is allowed to take more than four years if you claim your four-year program. That's really harsh. What about climate? Eighty percent. What else? Eighty percent seems low. Well, I mean, it could just be you know, if you're doing a good job, you should be able to graduate in four years. So you think it should be high, like eighty percent? What's the bare minimum you would accept as acceptable for a four-year program? In 10 years? I'm sorry? In graduation in 10 years? Or in, in, that in, in 10 years, if I look at how many students graduated in four years or less, what do I want that percent to be? If I'm claiming it's a four year program, what's the minimum you would say is acceptable? No, you're allowed to have people drop out. But I'm saying if your program is claiming to be a four year program, what do you say the minimum your graduation rate has to be? If you want to claim a four-year program, what percent of your graduate students must get their diploma in four years or less? 60, 70. 60, 70? Yes. Uh, I'm just thinking of 70. Okay, so you, you, you all have very high standards. I'll, usually when I do this, people say just about 50%. You have to have more people doing it in four years than not. At this hypothetical school that I will not mention, it was zero. Not one student graduated in 10 years, in a 10 year period in four years, and they were claiming to be a four year program. At least four students a year. So it's a significant data point. How many graduated in 10? I don't know. Um, but there were some people there who were more than a decade old in graduate wow. school. And people, there was a lot of people dropped out of the 10 years for That's a longer story. Okay. <laughs> and again, for some people, when it's taking more than 10 years, there's often some issues with the student. They may have your family issues or whatnot. Let's try to look at another way of doing this. And this is a way that generalizes really well. And this is related to the video that I know you all watched on the M&M game. So let's try to calculate using a maybe memoryless process. So we want to calculate what percent graduate eventually. How many people graduate in that first period of time? P. Now, let's look at all the people who didn't graduate and didn't withdraw. Okay. Of those people, what percent eventually graduate? Not how many graduate in that year, what percent eventually graduate? The answer's on the board. It's one of the symbols that's already on the board. This is the key idea for today's lecture. P is the percent that graduated in that specific time period. I want the percent who graduate eventually. Now we have to multiply you know, percent that graduate eventually. What percent of people graduate eventually when P percent graduate every year and Q percent withdraw? Yes, DPQ is the percent of students that graduate. Once I've got that first period of time done and I look at everybody who's left over, does it matter that they didn't graduate? Maybe to them, but for what we're doing, it doesn't matter. It's a new game. It's a memoryless process. So we get this beautiful equation. DPQ is P plus 1 minus P minus Q times DPQ. We can solve for DPQ. So if we bring it over to the other side, we get 1 minus 1 minus P minus Q times DPQ equals P. Well, what's one minus one minus p minus q? That's p plus q. And so this implies d 
PQ is P over P plus Q. This is the power of memoryless processes. We set up this beautiful relation and it bypasses the infinite sum. So one of the goals of this class is proof techniques. This is one of my favorites, is if you can reduce something to a previous state, many times it doesn't matter how you get there. I know we have at least one chess expert in the room, so he can correct me if I'm wrong, it's, if there's a threefold repetition of state in chess, it's considered a draw. Yeah. So when you're looking at a configuration on a chessboard, it's not enough to just know where the pieces are. You also need to know what have the previous states of the board been. This is enough to guarantee that every game of chess has to terminate in either a win, a loss, or a draw. So this is an example where you might not have every game going up to a win or a lose. You know, there can definitely be paths that will lead to draws. So that's more interesting than this example. So we have to make this even more interesting. And so this is what I'll leave for you to think about at home as to what you can do to make it interesting. I have some thoughts. So assume P percent of students graduate and Q percent leave and they'll never return after four years. And then in every subsequent year, P of F of N percent of the remaining graduate and Q, G of N, eventually leap. So we did, you know, F of N equals G of N equals what? One. So that case was boring. We were able to solve it too straightforwardly. Can somebody give me another interesting choice for F of N? What's a simple choice that you might want to try? I'm sorry? So you could try f of n equals g of n equals two, or any constant. That might end up being very similar to what we did. That might just be replace p with p squared, but that is different than the initial. The initial was p, and now you've got a p squared. What else could be a good choice? n squared. n squared. Um, I can't let you do n squared. What should you do before n squared? n, right? So try maybe f of n equals g of n equals n. Or maybe n plus 1. F and g of n don't always have to be equal. They don't always have to be equal. And so I have some thoughts about what should be done maybe for f of n and g of n to make things interesting. So find something fun. Shouldn't um, G of N be kind of the same because the longer you stay, the less likely you are to graduate? Well, that, that, well, that's the question is, do you think that the longer you've been there, do you think you're finally getting more and more likely to finally graduate and less and less likely to withdraw? You know, I've, started, I've stuck it out this long, I'm not gonna quit. We've already gotten rid of the weak. I just need a little bit more time. I think you go either way. You can go either way. You can tell lots of different stories. And depending on what story you want to tell, um, I will risk this. How many of you have seen Return of the Jedi? Is there anybody who hasn't seen Return of the Jedi where they will be afraid if I mention something from the movie? So a key part of the movie is they need the shields to come down. And at what point do you say, they're not going to do it. The shields aren't going to come down. we got to call off the attack. Or Han can do it. We just need to give him more time. He'll eventually succeed. You know, he's got a friend who's writing the script. Right? Do you think that if you just give them more time, it's going to succeed? Or do you think, no, no, no. If you were going to do it, you would have done it by now. You can tell both. And that's what's great about these models. Depending on who you're modeling, you might be modeling something. Look, I came from a really bad background. Um, didn't have many resources. I really struggled. Family issues. I had to withdraw from school to help them, but I did it. You know, I have a friend from college. I'm old. Um, he likes to make fun of me because he's a little bit younger than I am. And he finally got his PhD in math. It took him a long time to get there, but he finally did it. And you know, he's got to be very 
I'm not going to say anything because this is being coy, but you know, he did it. It took a long time, but he did it. He had the drive. So the, it's great when you have parameters and models that you can adjust. All right. Now, we've done this. So we're going to now play some games. And so I, I like to believe I have more toys per cubic uh, meter than anyone else in their offices on campus. So you know, it's not hard for me to find things. So I'm a very patriotic person. I love this country. And I know we have people here who like poker. So I have some chips. All right, red, white, and blue. Now it's red, white, and blue. Okay. These will be called prizes. And I'll have this bag with lots of different things. And we will assume that all of them are equally likely. But if I just reach in, you're equally likely to get any of them. In this case, they happen to be three particles. And I'll reach in, and I will pull out a white. And I'll put it back. So I've got so many of them, I'll just leave it out so we know we got a white. I'll then reach in, and I'll pull out another one. And this time I pulled out a red. And I reach in, and I pull out, and I pull out a white. So I have all three colors. Now, it's probably the easiest question to for you. I reach in, I pull out, it's a white. I reach in and I pull out, it's a white. Getting a lot of white. Reach in, pull out, another white. I'm, so at this point, what are you thinking? There might be more white than it could be. I reach in and I pull out, it's another white. Reach in, how much time do I have to pull out for today's lecture? And I pull out a blue. There we go. So it took me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tries to get one of each color. Do you think the colors are equally likely? This is one string. How confident are you? On the first turn, how likely are you to get something that you don't have? 100%. And so the question we want to study here is, if there's just one prize, how long does it take us before we find that first prize? And this is something you might be doing in probability. And then once we understand the one prize, then we'll get to two prizes. And then hopefully today we will get to the challenging bridge question uh, that came up uh, yesterday. So let's say on each turn you have probability P of receiving a prize. Let's calculate how long we expect to wait to get it. And so, in this case, it's a chip. Yeah, but like, well, no, right now we're considering there's just one prize. So uh, right now, let's just say the prize is, is the blue chip or the red chip or the white. We'll do the white chip so this is making no one feel uncomfortable. So the white chip is the prize. And so if I don't get a white chip, it's no prize. And each box is as likely to have a red, white, or blue. So what is your probability of getting a white chip in this case? Anybody want to guess on average how long you have to wait to get a white chip? Three. If there were six chips, six colors, what would you expect? One sixth. So this is really the notion of expected value. You know, how long do you have to wait? So what's the percent in one turn? Percent in two turns, percent in n turns. So what's the probability you get it in one turn? Well, in, right, but in general, it would be, no, no, in one turn, it would be P, right? And what's the percent of the time you would get it in two turns? One minus P times P. And what's the probability you would get it in n turns? And so if we want to calculate the expected weight, for those of you who know the phrase expected value, I'm calculating the expected value. It's just going to be 1 times p plus 2 times 1 minus p plus dot, 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 plus n times 1 minus p to the n minus 1 p plus dot, dot, dot. We need to figure out what that sum is. A better way of writing the sum, maybe, is to write this as 
Oh, sorry, all these have a p. I'm going to write it as p times 1 minus p, and then 1 times 1 minus p um, plus 2 times 1 minus p squared plus dot 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 plus n times 1 minus p to the n plus dot dot dot. Does everybody understand why I would write it like that? That way, the power is the same as the number in front of it. What term am I missing? Yeah, and if I want to, I could even put in a zero times one minus p to the zero if I wanted to, because that's just going to be zero. Does this look like anything we know? It looks like a geometric series. And so this allows me to introduce one of my favorite techniques, differentiating identities. How many of you have seen differentiating identities before? So the idea is it's a lot of work to prove an identity. Once you have an identity, wouldn't you like a magic box that gives you infinitely many new identities from that? And if you're one of the first 10 mathematicians who masters this, you get a free set of Ginsu knives. I feel like one of these shopping network you know, spokesmen. It's really a great method. It generates infinitely many new identities. Now, you have to take a little bit of high level analysis to justify what I'm about to do. This is where, for those of you who were uh, here before class started, I mentioned my freshman physics professor said, and in a math class, they would spend six weeks justifying this step, moving on. And so take advanced analysis. So let's let f of x be the sum, n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n, and that's one over one minus x if the absolute value of x is less than one. If I take the derivative of f, that's the derivative of this infinite sum. And I'm going to also multiply by x. So I'm going to take the derivative and multiply by x. What is the derivative of, of an infinite sum? What would you like to do? You pretend you're a physicist or an economist. Yeah, switch them. Yeah, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. If it's a finite problem, you can do that. And you should be able to prove that. So in your calculus classes, you hopefully proved the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. We might have talked about proving this by induction with parentheses. If I have three functions, the derivative of f plus g plus h, I group f and g together, and then that would be f plus g prime plus h prime, and then that's f prime plus g prime, plus h prime, and then I can just drop the parentheses. And that's how you would get the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. This works if you have a finite situation. Let's just pretend we can do that. So it's going to be x times the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of n x to the n minus 1. Oh, well, that's just the sum, n goes from 0 to infinity, of n x to the n. And this is just x times the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x. So if we can justify that switch, then this infinite sum is just the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x times x. Thus, the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of n x to the n. So when I take the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x, that's 1 minus x inverse. A negative comes down, I get 1 minus x to the negative 2. I get a negative 1 from that. When the dust settles, and you can do the differentiation at home, you get x over 1 minus x squared. So going back, using the next page, this is going to equal p over 1 minus p. And now, in this sum, what does x equal? So what do we want x to be over here? 1 minus p. Then we would get 
the sum is x over 1 minus x squared. So then that would be 1 minus p over 1 minus 1 minus p, which is just going to be p, so we square that. And look at all the dust settling. You get 1 over p. So how long do you have to wait if you have probability of p of success? 1 over p. That's a nice result. But is it a nice proof? This is a wonderful method. This is a method you can use many times, but we need some analysis to justify. So can we prove this without analysis? Can we do it more simply? So let's let, um, W for weight be how long we wait on average. Okay, let's try to find a nice formula for how long we have to wait on average. What's the probability we only have to wait one turn for our first success? P. Now, if we don't have the first success, how long do we have to wait from this point onward? Well, P would then be, we have the success on the next turn. How long on average do we wait from this point? WP. It's just WP, right? And it's just going to be how long we wait on average plus what? Plus one, because we've already waited once. So we get WP is P plus one minus P times WP plus one. So that's going to be WP equals P plus one minus P WP plus one minus P. I P plus one minus P, I can do that. That's WP equals one plus one minus P times WP. So if I subtract, I get one minus one minus P WP equals one. So I get P WP equals one, therefore WP equals one over P. Same result. So much and again, this is the point I'm trying to emphasize today. Don't need to use advanced analysis. Don't need to deal with infinite things. It's the value of this memoryless process. Once we've waited, it's like we're starting a new game. Too many times in life, people cannot understand fixed costs. You've already paid for it. And at some point, I want to start talking more about dynamic stuff. I really want you to have useful things from this class. Um, so let's make things a little bit more interesting. There are now C prizes, and each box is equally likely to have one and only one of them. So we have, in this case, we have three of them. How long do you expect to wait for the first prize? One. one, right? Because you don't have anything. So how long do you wait for the first? One. Now that you have the first, how long do you have to wait before you get the next one? What's the probability of getting something new? C minus one over C. So here, P1 is equal to one. P2 is C minus one over C. So the time I have to wait for the next one is gonna be one over its probability. Does everybody understand this? I'm just looking for something new. Now, how about the third one? What's the probability if I only have prizes one and two, how long do I have to wait before I get something new? And so that would give me a C over C minus two. Well, no, th that's the probability is C minus two over C. And then the wait time is one over that. How long do I have to wait to get my third new prize? 
do I really want to write P1 as one? How should I rewrite P1? I should write it as C over C, right? Oh, whoops, I got the numerator and denominator wrong. Bad math joke. So if you look at this, what do we get? We get WC is equal to C times one plus one over, I'm sorry. I, I packed out the C and I get one over C plus one over C minus one plus dot, 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 plus one over one or it's just C times one plus one half plus one third plus dot 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 plus one over C, which is just C times HC, the C harmonic number. And HN is approximately N times the natural log of N. So you basically need to wait about C log C to get it. The larger C is, the better the approximation. So for us, when C equals three, the weight should on average be three times one plus one half plus one third. One half plus one third is five sixths, plus one is 11 sixths. So this is three times 11 sixths which is 11 halves, which is 5.5. .5. We had eight. What quantity should we calculate in addition to the weight? Variance. The variance. So if you know probability and stats, you know, what would be the variance? And so what I'm gonna end with today, and we just did it in time, um, is if I deal you one card from a deck at a time, I shuffle and I deal to you again, how long do you expect to wait before you have seen every card? That's what we just did. What's the answer? And then H52. And so the problem I want you to think about for Wednesday, and we'll talk about this, and I'll just stop here because I know it's, uh, 1050, so if somebody has to leave, that's fine. I'll read it. If you have to leave, that's not an insult. In bridge, the 52 cards are dealt 13 at a time to a player. How many deals are needed before a player expects to see each card at least once in one of their hands? So can you give me a nice answer to this? So sadly, I will have to go home to my daughter today when she comes home from school and say we didn't get to this. Fine. I wasn't expecting to get to this today, but I was hoping to get to the point where I can state it and you can think about this. Can you use the stuff we had to come up for a way to solve this? You could simulate this to hell, right? You can just write a computer program, do a million deals, calculate the expected weight, and, and that would be almost surely close to the correct answer. You could try to write down an incredibly painful formula with inclusion exclusion or with all the different stuffs and the probabilities. Can you come up with a nice natural way to solve this problem? I want a simple answer. Or if you can't give me a simple answer, I want a simple calculation that I can do. I don't want an infinite sum of incredibly complex terms. I want something simple that I could put in like a Google spreadsheet or Microsoft Excel, both companies give me money, that it will then just go through and just compute and find the solution to a recurrence. So that's the question to think about for Wednesday. Can you come up with a nice way to solve this? I hope you find it interesting. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh -huh.